Welcome everyone to uh, this broadcast of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And our de guest today is uh, re-entry advocate, uh, Joseph Crowder. Uh, before we begin with him, Will, what's with your shirt today? Fun funny you should ask. Today, this week's shirt is my USF shirt. USF finished their baseball season. They 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 won six to two. They won their last game six to two against the Portland Pi Pilots. Well, thank you, Will. Uh, we now uh, introduce uh, our guest and have some questions for him. Tell us about tell us about your background and, and what led you to being incarcerated. Right. So, <clears throat> I was born and raised in uh, Bakersfield, California, down south. It was a very like I was undiagnosed as an autistic until my thirties. And so just had a rough go of it. Like my thought processes, the mental emotional processes, everything like that was just a mess. My mental health was a mess. I was depressed, um <clears throat> angry, came from a broken home chose to hang out with the wrong people, believe in the wrong people, and trust the wrong people. Later on, I was diagnosed with a, a hero complex alongside my autism. I liked, even though like I was an angry and depressed person, it's like I like to help people. I like to take care of people and protect people. And that was that was twisted because of like all of my all of my issues and problems uh, that got twisted into me agreeing to participate in a revenge killing to murder a supposed rapist to protect the woman. So the killing happened in uh, November of 2005. Uh, we were arrested almost immediately. I was in jail for three years and I was sentenced to second degree murder f uh, at 15 years to life and served 15 years uh, and paroled in <clears throat> in December of 2019. Can you tell us about your life in prison? Yeah, absolutely. It was a life of extremes. There was extreme fears, extreme joys, surprisingly, extreme frustrations from every waking moment to right before I went to sleep. There is violence. There was, you know, times of, of violence and fights and things like that, but Honestly, like, they were some of the most important times of my life, I would have to say. I met some incredible people, and I met some incredibly horrible people as well. Not just uh, fellow prisoners, but also uh, people that worked for the administration, the staff, guards. Can you tell us when you were diagnosed with autism? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was diagnosed at the age of 32, April 2015 at San Quentin State Prison. It was an incredible feeling to finally figure it out. Um, it had been a long journey. It took me four years to get that test and diagnosis. I started right when I entered the system in 2008 and was inspired, uh, was inspired by a conversation with my mom, actually. It was because prior to that, my defense attorney wanted to have me tested for Asperger's, add like another another facet of defense for my case. And uh, I was tested in jail, but then he came back and said, well, Joe, it's like, you don't got it. We gotta figure something else out. And then years later, I have a conversation with my mom. She says, I went to go get my hair done, and I met my friend's son, and he acts and talks and thinks just like you. He even dresses like you. And I said, okay, what does that matter? And she said, well, my friend told me that uh, her son is autistic. I was like, Ah, and that like ignited a uh, confusion. I said, "Well, I'm gonna go get the old report from my attorney." Now, I, I back then I didn't know anything about uh, psychology lingo. It is very confusing. So I read through the report. None of it made any sense. And then, but at the very back of the report, there was a synopsis, and it said, "Mr. Crowder has, you know, clear indicators of, you know, this and this and this." It's like this is an indicator for. Asperger's. This is an indicator for autism spectrum disorder. This is an indicator of this. And at the end of every single one of those, it said, needs to be further investigated. Needs to be further investigated. And so I was just like, my lawyer lied to me. And so that lit a fire in me to seek out a test and diagnosis 
for myself, either a yes or a no, and included me risking my life multiple times on different prison yards. Because in the system, there are prison rules that are like issued and followed by the inmates themselves. They're not facility rules, they're inmate politics. And one of them is, it's like, we do not do mental health. And if you go to mental health and you are a threat because you're a liability, because you're crazy, there's no, there's no, oh, you're kind of unwell. There's just, you're crazy or you're not. And if you're crazy, you're a liability and you're a threat to the yard and you have to be removed. And by removal, that means that you have to be violently attacked. I chose to risk my life multiple times so that I could get this test and diagnosis. Joseph, do you think your autism uh, contributed to uh, your criminal behavior? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, it was discovered it was a major causative factor for the uh, acceptance and commission of, of the crime that led to my incarceration. I suffered from a lot of a lot of this, what's it's called black and white thinking. It's all or nothing. It's yes or no. Mm -hmm. And so that was like the major thing. It's like, well, I trust, I trust my friends. So yes, this is the right thing to do. This woman's being hurt. So yes, this is the right thing to do. The police aren't doing anything. So yes, this is the right thing to do. And, you know, and it's like, I was like, I protect people. That's who I am. So yes, mm -hmm. this is the right thing to do. There was like no deviation once these like links in the chain of flawed logic, like were set in place. And that, you know, led to me taking a person's life. It was awful. And so after, after diagnosis and after treatment began, you know, it was a complete, like, top to bottom dismantling of my, like, mental and emotional processes to figure out how to live and how to think and how to feel. And it was, uh, it was brutal. How did you, you sort of put yourself back together? Uh, was it therapy? Was it, it was therapy. self work? Tell us more. It was both. Um, so one of the great things I love about some of my traits is that when a when a realization that something is wrong happens, when I make a mistake, uh, like my my brain like rewinds the tapes, mm -hmm. so to speak, and tries to figure out where it went wrong, when it went wrong, and why it went wrong. And so, obviously, you know, it's like this horrible thing just happened that I participated in, and that's where everything went wrong. Mm -hmm. But why? And those answers couldn't be answered until I started therapy, until I was able to talk to someone and, and not even talk to someone, but like be able to listen mm -hmm. to what they were going to say. There was like this complete, like, lot, like, logic wall of just like you know you're not right i'm right you're wrong you don't know what you're talking about you haven't lived my life you haven't seen what i've seen etc and so on mm -hmm. and getting getting through that barrier so that i would be willing to listen and start to understand what caused what and why was uh was good the therapy you know was working excellent and and very, very powerful. I hear you saying that. Thank you. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, sure. Speaking of which, uh, um, due to the lack of care in prison, uh, did did uh, your therapist or attorney or both somehow did they get through to the authorities of what you needed in prison? So to get comfortable, they uh, the the short answer is no, mm -hmm. and it yeah, and it's not even a, it's like not just a no, it's like a hell no. The facilities, not just the facility, but like system wide, they use a phrase which is which is safety and security, mm -hmm. and everything falls under this massive umbrella of the safety and security of the facility. So anything that is not deemed necessary for the safety and security of the facility is completely and immediately just ruled out, denied, refused. And so that included everything from accommodations like a specific type of glasses, you know, like a weighted blanket, a fidget tool, you know, anything like this. This is from prison. I made this like a month after I was diagnosed because I studied, I started studying like all the different things that could like help the accommodations that could help me. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to make this in order to like help myself. There's nothing unless, unless the diagnoses of people in the mental health programs were 
a danger to themselves or to others, then the system didn't care at all. Is there any others that you met um, who were under the presumption of being autistic too? Yeah, I, I would definitely say yes. When, when I was in San Quentin, which is where I was uh, tested and diagnosed. When I was in San Quentin, San Quentin's a little unique, and they had like different ways for me to like share my story and to advocate while I was advocating for myself and fighting the administration to get things. And uh, once my story got out, people would approach me and talk to me and say, hey, you know, sometimes they would ask about their children. It's like, I've got a son, I think they might be on the spectrum. They do this, and I said, okay. It's like I have these books, you know. Let's let's talk about it, and or some people ranging in age from like nineteen to like sixty years old would come to me and and ask me questions and say, "How do I, you know, how do I do this? How do I live?" Mm -hmm. And I would tell them, "It's like go to mental health, mm -hmm. see if you can get tested, and if you can't get tested, then." We'll try, you know, we'll try something to try and alleviate whatever you're going through. We'll talk about it. Speaking of books, are there any authors that you admire or? Uh, fiction, nonfiction. Oh, or <laughs> types of books? Cool. Uh, there's, well, so the two books that I stood by that led me on my journey uh, was Asperger's from the Inside Out. And that's pretty much like the field guide that I share with people. And the other was uh, the complete guide to Asperger's syndrome. And so even though I know Asperger's is no longer used, um, back then it still was. Okay. And so those two books helped me, like they spelled out basically my entire life and uh, helped really like keep me inspired and driven to find, find myself, get my test, get my diagnosis. Can you tell us about your parole process? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's like Sisyphus, like rolling a stone up a hill, blindfolded, tied up, and like dragging yourself up the hill by your chin. The entire process is rigged. It is stacked against the person that is becoming eligible for parole. People, uh, people only have to go through the parole process, which is called a, par a parole board review, uh, if they have a life sentence attached to their sentence. So like I was sentenced to 15 years to life, meaning that I had to serve 15 years before I could be go to this interview and be possibly found eligible for parole. And I have to go through this interview process, which is a nightmare and an, an emotional assault um, in order to be found determined eligible for parole by these people that are, uh, are called like parole commissioners, basically. Uh, the system is rigged. They review your entire career in prison, your entire time in prison, anything that you've done, your offenses, your achievements, and all these different things, all these programs that you've done, therapies, treatments, rehabilitation, anything from like good to bad. They, they see it all. They weigh it all in their determinations they take you through this interview process where they talk about your crime. They ask if you have remorse. They ask all these different things. At the very end of the at the very end of this interview review, they tell you either, yeah, you're going home, or no, you no, you're not. And if they tell you no, you're not, then that means that you can be stuck in prison for another three, three, five, seven, ten, or fifteen years before your next parole review. It's a frightening process. It's incredibly anxiety driving. Being on the autism spectrum took away a lot of their ability to cause problems because it's their job. It's their job to poke at people and get a rise out of you because if you have like a strong reaction, they'll be like, oh, oh, you're still dangerous. Deny. You know, that's one of the, that's like the, the main like tool that they use. You're still a threat to society because you can't take pressure. So through, through six years of intense weekly therapy that was recorded and logged and they, had, uh, they were allowed to review all of that and see the processes and progress that I had made. And then an additional psych psychological eval before uh, I went to my parole board review, they um, were able to see 
all my progression and all my successes and all my you know failures and everything and so but the the good thing was was that my diagnosis my autism was like a shield it was like a defense system because it was it was on file it was on paper it was on record that I have this condition that's what they called it I have this condition I have this problem therefore uh, like I am you know easily anxious easily startled easily this easily that you know it's like and so it basically it cut the parole board off at the knees like they couldn't use a lot of their a lot of their tricks and tools to try and harass to harass me like they would others because was, you know they were just like Mr. Crowder has autism spectrum disorder. It's like he doesn't understand nuance. He doesn't understand things. He does not make eye contact. So all of the different things that they would try to use to deny me were taken away from them. And all that was left was the truth and what and accomplishments. Okay, so I was I was found suitable for parole on my first chance, my first shot. And uh, thank God for that. God's grace and dumb luck, I made it. And so I was found eligible for parole, and then I was released from prison custody in December of 2019. Can you tell us uh, about your life after parole? Uh, you've got employment, housing, uh, reentry advocacy. Tell us about those things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my reentry was hell. Uh, prison was bad. Reentry was probably worse because like prison, even though prison was bad, it still was able to like develop some forms of like security and like mental stability because I had a therapist. I had routines. I had, you know, structure, you know, all those things that a lot of people on the spectrum crave. When I got to reentry, everything was shattered. They asked me for a parole plan. It's like, what do you plan to do? I'm going to go to San Francisco. They've got a great mental health system. They've got all these autism support networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Two days before I paroled, uh, they crapped on all of it and said, the place that you were supposed to parole to, because lifers are supposed to parole to what's called a reentry housing program for six months in order to help them get reaccustomed to the streets. And that's a, that's a lie, but that's a whole nother thing. So the place that I was supposed to go rejected me two days before I paroled. I was forced to go to another program that was not situated for me at all in Oakland rather than San Francisco. And my parole agent told me like, we're gonna try and get you back to San Francisco, just hold on or hang out. I said, okay. But day one, when I met my parole agent, like I had like a raucous meltdown and just like was breaking down in front of him and the only thing she told me like she couldn't say you're gonna be all right she couldn't say you know just hang on she couldn't even give me like a freaking paper towel to wipe my face she just said man up dude and so my uh i was assigned a therapist through the parole office thank god for that and she was a hardcore advocate She's like no he needs this he needs this he needs this i didn't get any of it but the but the understanding of like do not treat him like this otherwise you will trigger an event was like the only thing once again the safety and security was the only thing they cared about and they're like oh, okay so we'll tiptoe around his emotional st state so anyway flash forward initial reentry was bad after adjusting, it got better. I used just, I used what brains I had just to like find the right types of like, the right types of things. It's like, I could only work in these certain types of jobs because I don't like to socialize. I don't like bright lights. I don't like, you know, crowds and what have you. I just began to do research using a smartphone, using the internet to, and using resources that my therapist offered. She, uh, she offered me a thing about meetup.com. That's how I discovered Ascend. Zero help coming from parole services, which they're supposed to give you to help you survive but so anyway it was, it was self-reliance that's that's the, like the long and the short of it it was self-reliance like I knew I knew what I needed to do in order to survive I knew what I needed to do to get the approval of the my parole officer to show them that I'm succeeding it was it was all I had to do all of it like there was almost nothing 
coming from other places. Reentry services and advocacy, like it's all been kind of like one man army, grassroots style stuff in person. I focus on mental health. Like I try to focus on people on the autism spectrum, but the ability to go and be with people and talk to them to see what, what they're going through is almost impossible. So I aligned myself with other reentry groups like Bonafide, another one called the California Reentry Project, Mount Tamil Pius College, which is on grounds in San Quentin. And you know, they would they would approach me and they'd be like, like Joseph, we have this person, we think that they might benefit from a conversation with you. I said, okay, great. And that ranges from everyone, any creed, color, belief structure, identifiers, <laughs> however, whoever, it doesn't matter. I don't want people to go through what I went through, so I want to make sure that I can help them if I can. Can you tell us uh, more about the life that you've built, yeah. uh, like your employment, your housing, uh, and more about the reentry work you've done? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was, like, once again, I loved, I love to say God's grace and dumb luck. A lot of it was, like, random interactions with people it was seeking out like it was seeking out assistance and not relying on getting assistance like that's one of the major things that I could say is like you have to be self-reliant because a lot of the times people will say either no or I don't know how so I found these different uh, support nonprofits within the city that dealt with like mental health one of them was called citywide another one is called Rams and they are for specifically for people with mental health concerns or diagnosis that want to get back into society that want to stop being outcasts and want to get back into the workforce and they helped me find find jobs and they helped me find specific jobs that were tailored to like my needs and accommodations and that was amazing and so it was incredibly hard to find like a career path but like finding long-term contract jobs was great finding stuff that was right up my alley that allowed me to save money to make money to pay rent and things like that and I found through my journey I discovered the community that I live within now and it's called the Second Life Project and the Second Life Project is an intentional community for formerly incarcerated humans and never incarcerated humans that choose to live together in communal homes and learn from each other grow from each other heal from each other and build these family style units that are just like incredible things to like to see just grow and evolve and become like a loving unit they're they're an amazing people their community is like all within the city and they're an actual big cornerstone for like my advocacy and reentry work now because like we're so tied in with the parole office and like the reentry homes like a lot of my a lot of my people whether they're my housemates or other people in the community they say hey it's like it's like you do a lot of mental health work it's like we have this person you know maybe you can talk to them I say yeah sure positive stuff like I I went back to school I'm going to San Francisco State currently for a creative writing degree. I I took an IT training course through the Rams program and uh, became a successful like IT technician. I work for Disney streaming services currently, and it's just putting in the work, not losing hope, not losing faith, not losing confidence in the capabilities that we have as a tribe. Thank you, Joseph. That was both incredibly powerful and incredibly inspiring. I really thank you for that. And I know our viewers will, will, will really be inspired by what you've just told us. Thank you, Keith. Today, I'm going to tell you about the book, A Kind of Spark. This is by Elle Nichol. She is a neurodiverse writer who lives in Scotland. There are neurodiverse people in England too. What makes this book special is it's about a scenario that we rarely see, either in fiction or in real life. This is an autistic 11 year old who stands up for what she believes in and despite all the odds she actually wins no she doesn't reform the school system no what she does is she asks the town council in the rural village in scotland that she lives in to erect a memorial for women during the medieval times now those of us who uh who learned about U.S. history, we've all heard of the famous, the infamous Salem witch trials, and apparently there were similar incidents in the British Isles, and so she wants her village to commemorate the women who, well, there's this uh, very obscure song lyric from the 1990s, pinned down and abused 
for being strange. These women were strange, so they were accused of being witches, and they were murdered, or because people believed that they were witches, and some of them it could have been on the autism spectrum. Some of them could have been mentally ill. Some of them could have been all of the above. We'll never really know the reasons why they were targeted. Yeah, because she's autistic, people call her concern about this an obsession. Now, if Martin was a- Thank you very much, Jennifer. We'll now hear from um, Stacey Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. Monday, May 29th, Memorial Day. Uh, there will be a sunset hike in San Francisco. Details are to be determined. It starts at 5.30 p.m. And the person or the website to find out more info is the autismsociety.org. Saturday, June 3rd, will be an Ascend general meeting on Zoom. Daniel Middleton and Keith Halperin will have a continuation job talk on making the most of job fairs and employer events, followed by an interview with them by Job Club facilitator Michael Burnick. Uh, job Club member Mark Romoso, excuse me, Rom, Romoser, will discuss his new job with the city of Oakland. And um, attendees are encouraged to bring their experiences, any questions, and the Zoom meeting URL will be um, emailed to those on the mailing list. Um, once it gets around to the day. So um, Saturday, June 10th will be a Pillar Point Bluff hike, another hike at Moss Beach in Half Moon Bay. Um, It can be reached on, you could do Route 1 or Cabrillo Highway, which leads to Pacifica, et cetera. Um, There's the North Intersecting, uh, Cornwall Avenue, um, RSVP, not required, but recommended, and Join Lisa, Lewis, and family for a walk along the Jean, something the Jean Trial Trail and Freshman Reef uh, Pillar Point. So, and that will be when does that start? Uh, well, either way, it's Saturday, June tenth, and you can email Lou, Lisa Lewis at lewis at sonnet dot net. And last but not least, uh, Sunday, June eighteenth, Father's Day. Mini golf morning at uh, the yeah. Subar Alameda, 1600 Park Street in Alameda, 10 a.m., Lincoln Avenue, and it's free. Uh, there's very few spots left, so RSVP at info at sfautismcity.org. Thanks. Well, folks, uh, that's it for this week's program of uh, Send TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Alperin. I'm Will Burnick. Stacy Kennedy. I'm just Jennifer Brooks. I'm Joseph Crowder. Until next time, very best to uh, one and all.